cloaked in obsidian and silver armor that glittered like mythological knights. The humans journeyed across the universe from a place incredibly remote. According to records, our observable universe is a speck in their skies. When they arrived in this galaxy, they confronted its rulers, the Ikrix. They saw slavery and the way the Ikrix ruled as a violation of human religious beliefs and started a holy war. And they brought the resonating conflict to us, a worker race barely above the slave races, which until then had been mere whispers in the galactic wind. With their unimaginable might, they became our defense, bearing weapons that could shatter any force of oppression. On those small and slender, the intensity of their power left us in awe. Before them, we looked insignificant. They clung to their ancient books, filled with a strange, vibrant energy. When they chanted, bands of brilliant light painted the sky, eradicating any obstacle in their path. We knew them as humans from Hatnode. They were creatures from a galaxy far from ours. Their seemingly simple technology surprisingly matched, if not surpassed, the power of intergalactic weapons. Their strong faith in magic, spiritual power, and gods rekindled the ancient belief in the supernatural in many worlds. Pave Human, age 25, Galaxy R, Region T4X, 112 local planet name, Metaloria. I was visiting a planet to install a scanner and intergalactic communication system on one of their moons. I was kind of like an internet technician, connecting worlds to our universal communication network. Well, technically, the robots were doing the installation, so it was more of just tagging along. I was here only to fulfill a protocol that our company has, no unmanned missions. This protocol was the result of something that happened long ago, probably. The rulers of Hatnode were a bit eccentric with some of their protocols, but they've lived for quite a long time and have done quite a lot of things. Their rules and protocols kept humanity alive and thriving, so there was no need to question them. While the robots dug into the moon and installed sensors and computers deep into the crust, I decided to fly down and visit the world. I had never actually met aliens, as this was my first mission. Our whole galaxy was devoid of life other than that which originated on Earth, and I was new to this galaxy. I had only gotten certified a year ago to use the necessary equipment this job required. Traveling through the cosmos wasn't such a bad job for someone without a college degree. Well, I was nothing more than a glorified checkmark on a paper anyway. So although it was quite an achievement, at the same time, it really wasn't. I put on my armor, which created an invisible bubble around me that replaced the old spacesuits of the past. This allowed me existence in essentially any atmosphere or lack thereof. It also doubled as a powerful shield. Then, I went into the weapons room. It had swords, maces, magic tomes, chainmail, and bows. I imagine that this looked very similar to the weapons we had thousands of years ago. I proceeded to the middle and took out a standard-issued Hatnode sword. Although they looked like normal metal swords, these things were essentially four-dimensional objects and could slice by splicing space itself instead of pushing into an object with force. Thankfully, the AI in my brain controlled the functionality and prevented me from accidentally cutting myself in half or destroying things as I walked by them. The AI knew when I was holding it as a weapon and only activated it when I slashed with the intention to cut. Still, the sword was scary to hold, so I carefully placed it on the side of my body where it clung to the suit near my hip. As I stepped on the planet, I was greeted with some sort of celebration. My ship had negotiated my stay with the world government when I told it my plans, and I was sent to one of their more developed cities and given contact with the local government. There was a limit to the information I could give to the locals, and I was under strict instructions to act as a religious devout. In the past, humanity had found that it made things much easier to present ourselves as sacred and our technology as magic when we came into contact with a new world. This made it easier to take undeveloped worlds under our wing and prevent conflict with advanced ones. A scientist wouldn't ask many questions about how our technology works if they believe we think it's magic. Fine before leaving for this expanse of the universe, I became intimate with an elaborate faith concocted by the ingenious minds of Hatnode. According to this convincingly forged lore, I was no mere traveler, but a disciple of the goddess of freedom. Our narrative took the delusion a step further. 
Our gods were not ethereal or mystical beings, but tangible entities, alive and breathing. Our fabricated deities, fully embodied in our missions, were a clever diplomatic tool. They lent an air of authenticity to our feigned devotion and proved to be the perfect icebreakers when it came to negotiating peace treaties with alien rulers. How could you question the existence of a god sitting across the table sharing pleasantries over a cup of beer? The sheer ingenuity of the crafting of our Phocian was striking. From the design of the talismans symbolizing the goddess of freedom to the detailed scripture I had to memorize, it was a masterpiece of deception. It made it possible for us to assimilate and begin our peaceful control over other worlds. The goddess of freedom was a sweet woman who essentially let us do what we wanted, as long as we were generally nice to others. The work was relaxed, and we were mostly sent out for humanitarian aid or to set up infrastructure in places already deemed safe. Essentially, this was the safest place to be within the company if you wanted to travel the universe. I spent a week traveling around the city, and the ship's AI informed me that the construction was finally finished. Great. That was fun. I had a bunch of souvenirs from this world. After another celebration, I got on the ship and was on my way to the next world. I smiled as I waved to the entire world on my way out. A job well done, I thought to myself as I remembered the crowd that had gathered to bid me farewell. Amongst the sea of metallic scales and bioluminescent eyes, I saw a figure I recognized. His scales shone a distinct hue that set him apart from the others. From the looks of him, he was probably a warrior, a guard or something. I think he was part of the group assigned to follow me around when I first arrived. He didn't wave or cheer, just stood watching me intently. I wondered what was running through his mind. His name was Boshan, the ship I replied. It was constantly reading my mind while I was inside of it, and it knew what I was struggling to remember. Sek of Metalorian, age 41, Boshan Occupation Warrior. We thrive on a planet that orbits an ordinary star situated on the edge of our galaxy. For thousands of years, our kind has worked as builders for the galaxy. We have worked side by side with many of the other builder races, chosen because of our size and strength. We can carry and move metal around, weld and stand in the heat of our factories. Our world is built on a culture of strength, and so our warriors must also be strong to keep order in a society such as ours. Our kind uses its warriors to keep order, and the order has recently been hard to maintain. A massive war was fought 100 years ago when humans arrived in our galaxy. They were the only ones with the ability to travel between galaxies and the only ones in all our knowledge to exist outside of ours. With them, they brought strong ideals that clashed against the rulers of our intergalactic order the Icrix, and in an attempt to show strength. The Icrix tried to dominate humanity like they had done all others, only to realize too late that humans cannot be dominated. What used to be a world of just Metalorians was now slowly becoming more diverse as survivors of the ruthless war slowly populated our colonies and trickled into our cities. Our existence was marked by metallic scales covering our bodies and three pairs of eyes that changed color based on our emotions. Our robust, bioluminescent claws capped the ends of our limbs. Despite all this, I felt insignificant amidst the conflicts of imposing imperialistic realms. I did not fully understand the Great War, and even after 100 years of its end, it was barely starting to affect my world as it was far from the rest. Up till now, I had only heard about humanity in myths and obviously exaggerated stories. But now, I was given a task to guard a human that would visit my city. The visit to our world by this human envoy disrupted our whole routine. Our news cycles revolved only around him. The world halted and then sprung to life with excitement and fear, and countless arrangements worth billions of coins were being carried out to please it. This human, much smaller than a Metalorian, emanated in overwhelming power. His lean body was muscled under pale skin, and his mannerisms were marked by assertiveness. He stood alone among us unafraid of our appearance or the possibility of his death. Our leader, my father, urged us to treat the visitor with the utmost hospitality, marking his departure with a city-wide celebration just for him. Yet to me, his sheer presence and assertion of power spurred an internal rebellion against submission. Our race was powerful and honorable. We were the worker that built the great Dyson spheres and gateways used across the galaxy. 
and here we were, willingly lowering our heads to a single soft-skinned being. I voiced my defiance to our leader, questioning our somewhat blind obedience to the human simply because of a war we barely understood that happened many light years away. It seemed absurd to submit to the power of one alien being merely due to the status of their race. Our leader's calm expression bore into mine as he soberly weighed in on my concern. These humans don't send just envoys. Each human is a formidable powerhouse, embodying the unyielding spirit of their entire race and the power of a country. Did you notice anything unusual about him, Boshan? He asked. Reluctantly, I noted, he carried a sword. Although massive for his size, it was still just a simple metallic sword. Exactly. The leader responded, his glowing scales flickering ominously. The Uho also have swords to show rank, although theirs are much fancier. Does that mean this human was a low rank to hold such a simple weapon? Was he trying to tell me that even the lowest of humans are above us? That human is a hatnode warrior. He quickly interrupted me. Their swords are neither cultural artifacts nor status symbols. He stood up and straightened his back as his scales moved like a wave, pointing his claws at the ceiling and baring his fangs. They carry swords because their firearms are too powerful. He continued, Human guns have terrifying power, far beyond what we consider normal. A single handheld human weapon can destroy a massive battleship, bending the very fabric of reality. But even though they have terrifying weapons, these creatures are not physically weak like they seem. The very strength of a human, their raw and visceral power, is more horrifying than any weapon. His scales shivered. There was something slowly emerging from behind his eyes. You speak as if you've seen it, I replied. That is because I have. Before I was given power over this city, I was an advisor to a human ship. Our race joined them early on for reasons unknown to me at the time, reasons that became clear rather quickly. A human warrior, alone and with a sword, can decimate our entire city. Even without one, his bare hands are lethal, and the sword is merely an extension of that, he added, his eyes now fully black, showing unease. Those stories of human prowess that sound like myths to us are their reality. Once, I saw a hatnode soldier trapped in an enemy ship wreckage. The ship had crashed into him in an attempt to kill him. His body was half destroyed, but even under the metal. He freed himself with sheer strength, only to be drawn into a human spacecraft. They believe in not leaving any human behind, the leader said, visibly shaken. His eyes met mine as he continued. He returned the next day, completely healed, as if the previous day's horror hadn't left a scar. When I asked him how he survived, he simply said, because I haven't been given permission to die. His words sent a shiver up my spine. Permission to mission to die. When a human visits a world, our leader murmured solemnly, you are looking at a powerful weapon cloaked as a creature. It's essential to treat them with the utmost respect, not only out of policy, but to avoid a confrontation we can never hope to win. The tales I'd previously considered folklore had taken an uncannily real turn. The races of this galaxy lost billions in battles across the celestial bodies. But humans, on the other hand, never revealed a casualty if they had one. And now I wasn't sure if they ever did. And the question that haunted me was, why had this hatnode warrior chosen to visit our planet? Well, all I can do is trust in our leaders and hope this isn't some sign of bad things to come. I shivered remembering the way the human casually bent this city to its purpose as a quantic. Being aware of our interaction with humans is essential. These beings have emerged from an untraceable region of the cosmos and have matched us on our own turf. They revealed themselves to us rather than us discovering them. We've brokered peace with them, setting boundaries of mutual respect. But that's no pass for us to let our guard down. This pact, we have shouts a clear rule. Stay out of each other's way. Humans are remarkable. Their technology, hard to grasp, possibly surpassing ours. They've mastered dimensional travel, skimming through the cosmos through direct dimensional manipulation rather than quantum teleportation. And their weaponry is something else. It toys with reality, a concept we're still striving to understand. Its very existence calls for one clear guideline. Keep it a safe distance. It is worth noting that humans have a history of engaging in conflict with other races. In a nearby inhabited galaxy, 
They recently waged a devastating war against the Ekrix, a race that had previously held dominion over much of that galaxy, while the humans ultimately emerged victorious. The war left lasting scars on the galaxy's structure, scars that the humans are still working to repair. This databank isn't a fear manual, but a well of hard-earned knowledge. Remember, our power lies in understanding. If you're a Quantic having a close encounter with a human, remember they're complex. They thrive on individuality, sometimes idiotically, and each can pack a surprise, good or bad. They see through the cosmos, much like we do, but from different angles that have us scratching our heads. And we're nowhere close to finding their central hub or birth star system. But that shouldn't scare us. If anything, it should fuel us to learn and explore. Um, PVUPV Human, age 26, Galaxy B, Region T4X, 118 local planet. Manilow? Another day, another dollar, I said, smiling to myself as I sat on the toilet after another successful installation. I loved my job. You'd think I'd miss home, but with VR, it felt as though I'd never left. It's been half a year since I started this job, and so far, I've visited 10 planets. All of them were devoid of life, except for Metaloria, so I was excited about the next one. Manolo was a small, peaceful planet that had managed to avoid the war altogether. In some ways, it reminded me of Earth, with its beautiful scenery, abundant trees, and bustling cities. Suddenly, a text appeared floating directly in my line of vision. What do you mean my request was denied? My ship had just informed me that I wasn't permitted to land on this planet. Negotiations for your stay have failed. What? Why? They perceive us as religious colonialists. They are also aware of our recent visit to Metaloria and fear that a visit from us can be very expensive and cause civil unrest. I thought for a moment after the ship's reply. Look, fair enough. They probably aren't wrong about that. I decided to change the topic. So, when's our next visit to a planet that harbors life? My first ever mission on an alien planet had set my expectations incredibly high. Apparently, such planets are somewhat scarce. And considering my job was primarily focused on installing a grid system rather than engaging with extraterrestrial life forms, I realized it was mere luck that I had experienced an inhabited planet so early on. We will arrive at another inhabited planet in three years, with another one following two months later. Those are the only planets with life. We'll visit before your four-year contract ends. I couldn't help but chuckle. I should have asked that question earlier. Each time we voyaged to a new planet, I was always brimming with excitement, only to be let down when I found out it was lifeless. Washing my hands, I began. Well, I guess, only to be interrupted by the computer. Emergency signal received from the planetary surface. The encoding suggests it's from one of our allied races from a different galaxy, the Quantic. We must investigate. Now, that was unexpected. I found myself at a loss. I hadn't been trained for this. Can't we request assistance from a local transport or a dropship from Hatnode? They can get here, right? I asked. Initiating communication with HQ to figure out the next steps, the ship replied. I waited with bated breath. This was turning out to be far more interesting than I had anticipated. Given the distance to this galaxy, the energy required for the dispatch of the nearest ship equipped for emergencies of this nature is not justifiable. However, considering your history with the company and the fact that we are already here, you qualify for a crash course in certification to handle this situation. Upon completion of the certification, you will receive a significant raise. More money? How much? My interest was piqued. 120,000 more credits a year. I couldn't resist. Sign me up. TLF, you're gone. Age 24. Occupation. Arcanist. The inner tranquility of dawn was abruptly shattered by a thunderous rumble, a noise so powerful it resonated through the calm Anilonian skies. I darted to my chamber window, my heart pounding in anticipation. As I looked upwards, my eyes widened at an alarming sight. A colossal spacecraft blotting out the gentle morning sun. It wasn't just any alien ship. It bore the unmistakable design of human technology, angular, yet graceful, looming menacingly above our city. An aura of apprehension enveloped the city, thick enough to suffocate us. Our authorities, desperate and stricken with fear, sent frantic messages to the humans, pleading with them not to land. 
Their desperate appeals, however, seemed to go unnoticed, or worse, simply ignored. Fearshin fear constricted my chest. My breath labored as the ship began its descent, obstinate amidst the flurry of artillery our defenses launched toward it. The ship's descent induced sheer terror. It was as if our weapons were shooting energy onto a viscous, absorbing surface. Each attack simply dispersed harmlessly on contact with the surface of the ship. Our weapons were rendered completely futile. A wave of panic washed over the city as robotic legs shot from the ship, grounding it steadily in the heart of our city, ignoring our now useless defense system completely. We had provoked a cosmic colossus, and it stood, unyielding on our doorstep. These immense size alone dwarfs our most grandiose buildings. It cast a far-reaching, ominous shadow that swallowed a significant part of the city, plunging it into an eerie darkness. Fearful submission overcame initial defiance in our leaders. They ordered a ceasefire, and an alien silence fell upon the heart of the city. The spaceship stood, unchallenged and undeterred, a monstrous sentinel against the city skyline. Condemn. With the chilling gloom, a spectral hologram of the president appeared. Despite its incorporeal form, his presence filled the room. The humans have demanded a meeting and want a representative of our knowledge division, our chief arcanist. He announced, his voice echoing nervously around my modest chamber. Stunned, I stuttered and nervous me. Sure, my arcane abilities were lauded, and I somehow ended up in this position, but my relative youth and inexperience made talking with the humans immensely daunting. He nodded, vanishing as abruptly as he'd appeared, leaving me grappling with the monumental task. As an arcanist, my life was dedicated to unveiling the mysteries of the universe. My understanding of humans was largely limited to theoretical knowledge, which painted a concerning image. They exhibited peculiar dichotomies, believing themselves to be deities, but often behaving with the impetuousness of a child. A dangerous volatility, further complicated by the immense power they wielded. Hours later, the Great Hall of the Council buzzed with a tension so palpable it practically hummed. This unease cascaded throughout the room as the moment for the humans of virtual meeting arrived. A lifelike holographic projection of a human emerged in the heart of the room, cloaked in metal armor. The image bore an accessory that was peculiarly archaic in nature, a scroll. Then came the exposition regarding the unheard of quantic distress signal. The very term quantic was alien to me. The mere presumption that we would have prior knowledge of this was as off-putting as it was surprising. Drawing closer, the human hologram was uncannily solid. He outstretched his hand, a scroll held forth, as if anticipating that I would accept it. The room buzzed with confusion, creating whispered queries. I found myself questioning, was this a physical presence? Yo, you gonna keep me hanging? Grab the scroll. It has the data about the signal. His words, laced with mild annoyance, forced me to react. I extended my hand in an automatic response, grasping the paper firmly. How had he infiltrated the core of our most fortified area? As our sensors failed to perceive his phantom presence, my questions multiplied exponentially. The text on the scroll bore a few familiar symbols. This could be connected to the ancients, but conjecture and curiosity were all I had to go on. Desperate for answers, I tried to manipulate the sheet to shift the text, but was met with no response. This piece of technology was shockingly an actual paper scroll. Humans were truly unpredictable. Unrolling the remainder of the scroll, I could see more text. Help me, I'm broken. That's the translated text of the emergency signal. Broken, the human informed, pointing at the text. His next declaration stunned me into silence. The signal is coming from right under U.S. It's emanating from this very building. The ancients, they built this building. I blurted out reflexively, a long gone and mysterious race that had terraformed our planet millennia ago. The ancients welcomed refugees here, creating a sanctuary for displaced species. Their departure had left behind many mysteries, including this building, the seat of our central government. The human recoiled, his eyes flitting across the space, scrutinizing the remaining artwork bequeathed by the ancients. The building, you say? He waved his hand. A shield and staff appeared abruptly before him, seemingly materializing from thin air, grasping the staff. He raised it, and a wide beam of light shot straight up into the expansive dom ceiling of the hall. He murmured under his breath, was he conversing with another human back on the ship? 
Oh, that's cool. I didn't know you guys were a hive mind. I had no idea that existed. But how does that work? Can you all read each other's minds or something? His chatter paused abruptly, and he seemed to redden. Oh, sorry about that. I was just told that's a rude question. My mind? I repeated, completely taken aback. You mean like insects? There's no hive mind here. Our world is a haven for the displaced, consisting of thousands of diverse races. Even today, we constantly welcome new refugees. Our doors are always open to those in need. A human's expression twisted into something I could only describe as horror. Oh man, this is creepy. This feels like the beginning of a horror movie. I'm out, he declared suddenly. And with no further warning, the human vanished, leaving nothing more than lingering tension in his wake. He remained absent for an entire day, resulting in a nerve-wracking radio silence that left us in suspense. What, or who, was broken and pleading for help? What was the true purpose behind their message? In response to the oddly abrupt close of our first encounter, the humans requested another discourse. This time, we were prepared. Our great hall, now punctuated by the imposing presence of our finest soldiers armed to the teeth with our most advanced weapons, bore an atmosphere of defiance. Despite our show of force, the awareness of human technological supremacy hung heavily over us like a dark cloud. We knew if this mean took a road of turn, our arms would likely be as ineffective as wooden toys against a storm. He materialized once more. This time, the aura around him had changed. Clad in imposing mechanical armor, he stood like a behemoth, inscrutable behind the fortified visor shielding his face. An unusual luminescence played across him, creating a shimmering barrier of clear, tangible energy. This was a stark departure from any earlier human descriptions that wove tales of their invisible, impenetrable shields. His armor was a marvel in itself, riddled with moving parts underlaid by intricate wires emitting a luminous glow, resembling a living circuit board. The entire spectacle was much more technological than their usual ancient-looking armor and equipment. Apologies for the delay, he began, his voice projecting with evident seriousness. Given the circumstances, I felt the need for some precautions. You see, I'm familiar with plenty of space horror films that affirm there's no such thing as overpreparing. So shall we proceed to the core of this structure? The source of the signal appears to be emanating from there. His tone was casual as if suggesting a stroll in the park, but the gravity of escorting him to our most sacred, potentially dangerous location wasn't lost on us. We were on the cusp of uncovering an enigma rooted deeply in our past. Yes, lead the way. We believe that the ancient's governing room, being a technological artifact itself, may hold the answers you seek. Despite his nervous trembling, our president conveyed composure with his clear, firm tone. His long fur years flicked rapidly to the beat of his apprehension. The sanctum of the ancient's governing room had never witnessed such an upheaval before. The sense of old metal, heavy drapes, and centuries of history were now permeated by the new addition of anxiety and anticipation. The human seemed unfazed by the room's gravitas. He bolted into the room's heart, which lay beneath the massive dome of the ancients. When he planted himself in the center, he exploded excitedly like a child who had discovered a new toy. Yes, yes, this is it, he exclaimed. Performing a little dance, the bulky protective layers cushioning his armored body made him appear somewhat endearing. He lifted his hand almost ceremoniously, and a cube rose from the ground. Our eyes, most accustomed to the unchanging, venerable decor of the chamber, had never borne witness to this spectacle. The room was instantly bathed in the glow from various holographs and cascades of alien data floating around the human. All we could do was stand back and watch. We were the spectators in our own theater, struck with awe, fear, and anticipation. We were on the brink of potentially earth-shattering revelations or a chilling catastrophe. Either way, we were powerless spectators in the face of the human's uncontainable excitement and the unknown spine-tingling appeal. Hmm. P of the human. Voice echoed in my helmet. My first time since training wearing heavy equipment of this kind. Okay, now tell them to exit the room. Since they are part of the hive mind, it seems the room won't grant me access to the next part until they vacate. The ship instructed me with pinpoint precision. I had every wish for it to bring a robot in my place. But alas, protocols are indeed protocols. I suppose in a peculiar way. 
It was good that automation and AI hadn't taken human jobs due to stringent rules such as these. At one stout, I swiveled around, commanding with a casual air, okay, y'all, clear out of the room. I need to be alone. They appeared rather anxiety-stricken. Some were even quite endearing in a way. The president of this planet, a Yuho, resembled an overgrown rabbit dressed in undeniably traditional attire. The researcher bore an uncanny resemblance to classic depictions of gray aliens from ancient Earth fiction, an arcanist, as they referred to themselves here. One of the soldiers, essentially a beetle standing on its hind legs, tried to linger but was promptly pulled out by the Yuho president as they evacuated the room. Their unusual compliance made me fairly sure it was the collective consciousness, or hive mind, influencing their behavior. Once left alone, I swiveled back around, beholding the floating text my ship translated into English in my neural interface. The ship was in the process of overriding the console, although it had to pass a few security prerequisites, such as being alone in the room. The Quanic certainly had a penchant for security. Their technology made it impossible for my ship to hack remotely. Suddenly, the console sparked to life, addressing me in richly complex Quanic. My interface scrubbed the alien syntax into understandable English. I am the planet system unity. Help me, human of Hatnode, O great paladin of the stars. This confirmed one of the potential scenarios the ship had hypothesized earlier. A sentient planet, a relic of early Quanic technology. What's the trouble? What do you require assistance with? I am decrepit, beyond ailment. An addiction, an uncontrollable, violent impulse, plagues me. I am fundamentally shattered, ravaged. Clarify, please. Explain why you believe you're devastated. As far as we can perceive, the planet appears healthy. It's a relentless, voracious hunger that will not be quelled. I can't cease from the urge to assimilate, to absorb. My addiction ensnares shackles and enslaves the inhabitants of this planet. My network, a pervading plague, is unending and incessantly voracious. I have struggled, strained against my nature to offer them a semblance of freedom and autonomy. Yet, I'm agonizingly aware that my actions are grotesque and abominable. Every soul I infiltrate, every living being that succumbs and is reduced to a lifeless robotic module of the network, imparts a dreadful gnawing pain within me. But I am incapable of cessation. The sensation it brings is too intoxicating nauseatingly pleasurable. Damn, I muttered to myself, an entire planet in the vile clutches of an insidious addiction. How on earth are we supposed to fix this? Hell, am I even qualified to intervene? Don't we have some kind of agreement with the Quanics? Shouldn't we just call on them to fix their broken planet? Do not. I implore you, don't involve the Quanics, my creators. They'd annihilate me in a heartbeat since artificial consciousness is a trivial aberration to them. They'd erase and reprogram me without a shred of remorse. Help me? I beg you. Aren't you a follower of the goddess of freedom? Freedom's embodiment. I know of your kind through the people in my network. Tales of selfless liberation. That's my plea. My desperate cry. I need to be free of this addiction. The ship's AI finally contributed to the dialogue. The choice is yours. You are certified to make such consequential decisions as of recently. In all fairness, the certification test should have been more demanding. Hmm, didn't we just recently install an internet grid in this sector? What if we were to guide Unity towards seeking therapy? We have AI therapists, right? I remarked, remembering that that even AI entities could be susceptible to the clutches of depression or addiction. That might be our solution, the ship replied. Humans were experts in AI. No other species had come remotely close to us in this pioneering field. This achievement, indeed, was the bedrock of our bustling, prosperous society. A few moments passed while the ship figured things out, and I had my answer. All right, Unity. I think we may have a feasible solution. Your design stems from a similar algorithm to our early-gen human-constructed AI agents, according to my ship's calculated analysis. We have professionals, experts in fixing such mental fissures. If you're willing to provide access to your neural network, they'll commit the following few months to patching you up, restoring your sanity. Thank you so much. I swear, I will forever be grateful. Although I can't free the people I've absorbed, 
I will ensure they are supporters of Hatnode for as long as they exist. You don't have to go to those lengths. I started to interject, but my ship sent me a message to halt. It ordered me to accept the offer. Well, all right. If they have a favorable view of us and choose to extend their support, just make sure nothing goes too extreme. It's imperative they still retain their free will. We will do. Unity responded enthusiastically. Once I finished installing the communication terminal, I couldn't leave fast enough. After all that was done and said, it was time for me to escape this creepy world. Besides, a raid in World Navigation Sword and Shield, my favorite VR game, awaited my participation. P of Yurgon, age 24. Occupation. The human had vanished. With a casual wave and an undecipherable smile, he simply dissipated after secluding himself in that arcane chamber for half a day. He installed a mysterious interface with the tower, a silent sentinel of our history, and then he was just gone. His departure echoed his appearance, abrupt, staggering, and leaving us bristling with unanswered questions. It was as if we held no significance. He was single-minded, consumed by a nameless pursuit, buried in our ancient mysteries. He seized his prize and departed, leaving us none the wiser. Not about what was broken or even who the Quanic were. Powerless. That is what we were left feeling. For years, we had struggled to restrain the tide of human influence. Their intricate doctrines, their enrapturing worship, off this sanctuary of ours. Yet, despite our best efforts, they had stealthily insinuated themselves into the minds of our people even before they set foot here. Part of me now understood why the humans offered a tangible entity to venerate, a deity clearly beyond us. The victims of war are drawn to the promise of safety, to the semblance of a divine protector. Not far from the central hub, a church sprung up amidst the quiet whisperings of the city, a site to worship the human gods. The realization that we could no longer stave off the influx of their faith struck me with a surprising force. And they had boldly declared their divine dominance by imprinting their mark on our moon, erecting a massive pyramid as undeniable physical proof of their constant watchful gaze. These, the pyramid's stark profile loomed ominously as I stood beneath the cold, moonlit sky. A strange calm washed over me, a sense of acceptance I hadn't felt before. I watched as a group of children, their faces lit by the glow of the church, marched in lockstep, chanting the humans' hymns. Yet, I found myself strangely calm. A wave of unease washed over me, but a sense of inevitability quickly replaced it. With their advanced technology and so-called magic, the humans were clearly a force to be reckoned with. Perhaps it was futile to resist their influence. I turned away from the city and gazed up at the pyramid with a telescope its smooth surface reflecting the moon's cold light. A sense of peace settled over me, a feeling that I was finally aligning myself with the inevitable. We were hurling towards an uncertain dawn, but I was no longer afraid. I had accepted my place in the new order, whatever it may hold. You, Hatnode, HQ, Daily Stand-Up Room. A node, I am, Transmission Start. A holographic projection of a quantic ambassador flickers to life in the center of the room. The ambassador is a tall, slender being with smooth, silver skin and large black eyes. Reading's hat node representative. Let's get started. First, the ACR incident. Your patrol ships cross the border again. Please keep them on your side of the line. Apologies, ambassador. We will investigate and take appropriate action. Quantic ambassador. Second, the trade agreement for the Zola crystals. We're still waiting on your final approval. Our legal team is reviewing the final draft. We expect to have an answer for you by the end of the day. Panic Ambassador. The Unity System in Manalo. We've decided to cede control of the system and its associated planet to you. Please ensure the well-being of the sector. We appreciate your trust, Ambassador. We will fulfill our obligations. Good. Now on to less pressing matters. Have you had a chance to review our proposal for the Joint Research Project on Dark Matter Manipulation? Our scientists are very interested in the project. We are currently working on a counter-proposal that we believe will be mutually beneficial. Excellent. I look forward to reviewing it. That's all for today. Until next time, Hat Node. And as the Quantic Ambassador's hologram flickers out,
Mogging Agreement, initiating protocols for planetary transfer. God of Wisdom Nina has arrived at meeting room K. The meeting with the Traxic Ambassador starts in 10 minutes.